Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Dino Dave. And in about three minutes, we're going to talk about Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. All right. So that's in three minutes. And uh, in the meantime, you know, I'm going to show you a fossil that is not part of today's program. But for everyone who's joining us early, let's check it out, okay? Now, last summer, before the whole virus hit, um, my family, my wife and I took our kids to the Black Hills of South Dakota. And that's a great place if you want to learn about dinosaurs and fossils because there are a lot of different museums and national parks and state parks out there that have some fascinating geography and geology as well as a bunch of really cool animals. Now this thing here I picked up at a fossil shop. Can any of you guess what that might be? If you think you know, you can unmute yourself and you, and you tell me, okay? I'll give you a few seconds. All right, okay. We got a quiet group so far, that's all right. Now, what we have here is a crocodile skull. Now some interesting things, okay? This is how you tell a real fossil from a not real fossil. Now, uh, Fossils are great, right? Um, they can cost a lot of money and they're also very rare. So there are some people out there who try to make fake ones and sell them as the real thing. Now, as soon as I saw this, I realized that this was not a real fossil, okay? So what we have here is a crocodile, okay? Now we're gonna look really close at this thing, okay? We have a crocodile skull from the Cretaceous period and uh, it's from a country called Morocco. Now, Morocco has some of the best fossils in the world, okay? Spinosaurus, if you know that dinosaur, they've got them in Morocco, okay? As well as a whole bunch of other neat animals. Now, this thing, once I looked closely at it, at the fossil shop, I could tell that this whole thing was actually carved out of a single piece of rock. And then they just kind of glued little bits and pieces of fossil in here, and all of those teeth, that we have, those aren't even real crocodile teeth. Those are from an aquatic reptile called the Mosasaur. So someone carved this entire skull and then just glued in a whole bunch of teeth that they found. But I realized that at the fossil shop, I let them know my thoughts about that. And you know what? They gave me a really good discount on this. So even as just kind of a prop, a display piece, it's a neat thing, but again, when you're out fossil hunting, you're going to find a lot of real ones. But when you're going to gift shops and fossil shops, you got to be wary of whether the fossil is real or not. So it looks like it is one o'clock. Who's ready? Raise your hand. Excellent. Good. I can see two of you. You know who I'm talking about. Hunter. Which one of you is Hunter? You are? All right. Is that your little brother next to you? Yeah. Or your older brother? I'm joking. <laughs> okay. Are you five? <laughs> All right. So to reintroduce myself, my name is Dave. You can call me Dino Dave if you want. All right. And we've got a really fun program today. Do you remember what it's all about? It's all about T-Rex, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But because we're talking about T-Rex, I think we also have to talk about this dinosaur, right? Absolutely. What dinosaur is this? You probably know that already, don't you? Triceratops. Triceratops. Very good. Okay. So let's start off, okay? This is basically a big food item for T-Rex, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to talk about a few of the dinosaurs that were around when T-Rex was alive. Now we find T-Rex fossils kind of in the western United States, so South Dakota and beyond, all right? So T-Rex lived during a uh, period of time called the Mesozoic Era, which means the Middle Era, and the dates big dates. So dinosaurs first kind of appeared about 250 million years ago and then went extinct 66 million years ago when that big old asteroid went, right? Killed off all the big ones except 
birds, right? Birds technically are dinosaurs, but we'll get into that in a little bit, okay? Now, the Mesozoic era is split up into three sections. There's the Triassic period, there's the Jurassic period, which a lot of you kids know, and then there's the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous was the last one, and that started, boy, about 100 million years ago, and again, ended 66 million years ago when asteroid hit, right? Now, that's where we find T-Rex in that time period in the western part of North America and up in Canada and, okay, all Wyoming. sorts of, What's that? Yeah, Wyoming, very good. They found some very nice specimens out in Wyoming. In fact, there was one that they called the Y-Rex. Y means W-Y for Wyoming, so it's the Wyoming Rex. It was actually missing two-thirds of its tail. And they looked at the end of the tail and they found out that it was actually bitten off at some point in its life and it healed, which means we had this giant T-Rex walking around with just a little bit of its tail left because at one point another Rex came along and took a big old chomp out of that tail. And uh, pretty wicked, isn't it? It's cool. All right. So let's talk about some of the animals that T-Rex would have seen. Now, first of all, here's, here's kind of the smallest one that I want to talk about today. This here, I want to hear your guess. Is this a claw? Is it a tooth or is it a horn? Tooth. Tooth, okay. Claw, claw. You think it's a claw? Okay. And uh, anyone else, if you have a guess, you can unmute mute yourself. And T-Rex tooth. Because T-Rex teeth are a lot bigger, almost as big as a banana. Very good. You know what? I've got some T-Rex teeth that I'm going to show you that I would say are even bigger than bananas. Okay? So what we have here is a claw. It's a hand claw from the speedy dinosaur called an ornithomimus or ornithomimid. Now, if any of you have ever seen, here's my picture, the movie Jurassic Park, you may yep. have seen I've one seen of these. Does this look familiar? Yep, I've mm. seen all of them. Except Jurassic World, it's just Yeah. <laughs> so I know it shows up in a lot of the Jurassic Park movies. Now, this is a dinosaur. It's a group of dinosaurs called the Ornithomimids. There's Ornithomimus, Gallomimus, Struthiomimus. Okay, there are lots of them. This is a claw from one called a Struthiomimus. Now, Struthiomimus, its name means the ostrich mimic. I mean, copies the ostrich because it looks just like an ostrich, okay? In some ways, right? It, it also has some differences. What are some of the differences that you see? How about the long tail? Do ostriches have long tails? Mm -mm -mm. What about the long hands with the claws? Do ostriches? No, because their arms are now wings, right? So this is the claw from this dinosaur. Now they were about seven feet tall, okay? And maybe 15 feet long. But they also say that they may have been some of the fastest dinosaurs that ever lived, possibly running at speeds of like 35 or 40 miles an hour. Now, just to show you how similar this thing looks compared to an ostrich, are you ready? I'm gonna flip it. Oh my gosh, where did it go? I'm just, I'm messing with you. Isn't that cool? So ostrich mimic, because it, it's, general body shape looks a lot like an ostrich. Okay, so another one that I want to show you. What is this thing here? Ankylosaurus. Ankylosaurus. Yep, Ankylosaurus, very good. Hunter and Hunter's brother. Wes. Wes, Hunter and Wes, excellent, okay. I can tell already that you're gonna be some good helpers today. All right. Now, ankylosaurs were a group of armored dinosaurs. They were actually somewhat related to the stegosaurs from the Jurassic period, like 100 million years older, you know, before this thing was even around. But they had these hard bony plates all over the, their tops of their backs, and they had these wicked cool clubs that were great for swinging and hitting predators that tried to eat them, right? Another one. Now, this model is kind of old and outdated, but what, what do you think that might be? Iguanodon. 
Yeah, this is an iguanodon. Now, iguanodon is related to the Edmontosaurs, which are like the great big duck-billed dinosaurs. Some of them were huge, you know, four to six tons. They were the size of an elephant and with their tail were about 40 feet long. Now, kids, one really fun thing to do with these programs, try and remember some of these lengths or if you know how to draw or write out your numbers, just jot a little note, you know, iguanodon or the Edmontosaurs, Edmontosaurus, they were about 40 feet long, okay? They're huge. And then after the program, you take a tape measure or a yardstick or some way of measuring these animals. You go outside on the sidewalk or a backyard or a park and you measure them out. Really helps you understand just how big these things are. So we know T-Rex was eating these things, okay? Because we have fossil evidence. We have found skeletons of Edmontosaurus. Again, the big duck-billed dinosaurs with bite marks on them, okay? And that one kind of leads us to this dinosaur right here. What's that? Triceratops. Very good, Triceratops. And I think this Triceratops' is big brother or sister is behind me, right? Mm hmm So should we talk about Triceratops a little bit? Yeah, okay. Actually, I have a question. Yes. How do you know if a, a dinosaur is a boy or a girl? <gasps> Generally speaking, we don't know. That is such a good question. Okay, now how do I explain this? For the most part, we're just looking at bones, right? So it's really, really difficult to understand, you know, well, is the shape of this bone, does this mean it's a, a male or a female, meaning a boy or a girl? It's, it's hard to tell. But there was a scientist, uh, I believe her name was Mary Schweiter, Schweitzer, something like that. We've got a talk uh, in a couple of weeks called Women of Science. I wanna say that's in like two or three weeks from now. And um, we're gonna talk about Mary because one day she took a leg bone from a uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, okay? And she cut it in half and then took another very thin slice of that bone and looked at it under a microscope. And what she found is a very special layer of bone around the normal leg bone. It's just loaded with calcium. And because of that, Mary knew that she had a female or girl Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, the reason we know this is because birds, again, birds technically are dinosaurs, okay? Does this sort of make sense so far, Hunter? Yeah. yeah? All right, so birds, right before the mama bird is ready to lay eggs. She starts eating a whole bunch of foods that are really good for her and they're loaded with calcium. So, you know, you've heard grown-ups say, drink your milk because it has lots of calcium and it gives you strong bones, right? Yeah, we've all heard that, okay? Um, I still have people telling me that, okay? Drink your milk, Dino Dave. So, Mama bird does the same thing. She's looking for foods that are rich in calcium. And so she packs in all this extra calcium and actually grows this very special layer of bone around her entire skeleton. It's called medullary bone. And what that does is it stores all the calcium so that when she is ready to make eggs, her body can take all that extra special calcium to create an egg. And that's what Mary found with that Tyrannosaurus Rex leg bone. She found that same layer of that calcium rich medullary bone, which shows that we had a female or girl Tyrannosaurus Rex that was about to lay eggs. And I think that is so cool. Uh, this woman's contribution to Tyrannosaurus Rex science is just awesome. All right, that was an excellent question. Okay, now let's get back to this thing here. I kind of joke around and call it Hank the Tank. So I, I'll just keep referring it, to it as Hank, okay? So what we have is a Triceratops. Could any of you kids give me some random facts about Triceratops before, you know, before I start talking? No one knows what the frills are for yet. Oh, okay. Well, and let's talk they about that. Travel in giant herds. Yep, they did travel in herds. Yes, um, lots of evidence of that. We don't know how big the herds were, but 
Could they have been a few dozen? Could they have been a hundred? Could they have been a thousand? It's possible. But you're right, because herd animals have better protection when they work together, right? Just like animals today. You see deer many times will travel in groups because they're all watching out for one another, okay? One might see a predator, but another one might. So when they see the predator, what do the deer do? They run. Now this thing was a big animal. Hank is about 25 feet long. And some triceratops were even longer, about 30 feet long, okay? But tank is huge, okay? If you look straight up in the room that you're sitting in, most rooms, like in a house or apartment building, are about eight feet tall. That's how tall Hank is, okay? It's kind of hard to tell when you're looking at him through a, you know, a computer screen, right? But Hank is eight feet tall. He's just huge. And his skull is longer than I am tall. And I'm a pretty tall guy. I'm six foot four, okay? His skull is almost seven feet long. Now, here's the thing about Hank, okay? Let's talk about that frill. Hank is from a group of dinosaurs called the Ceratopsians, okay? And that means the horn-faced dinosaurs, okay? So, uh, triceratops, all the little root words come together, try. Do you know what try means? Not like try your best, the other try. Can you think of any words that have try in it? Triangle. Triangle. Because how many corners does a triangle have? Three. Very good. Yeah, I see you. You held up your three fingers. Yep. Are there any other words that you can think of with try in it? Does anyone have a tricycle? Or maybe you had one when you were younger? I, I have a tricycle. Okay, how many wheels does a tricycle have? Three. Very good, kids. Excellent. So, triangle has three corners. A tricycle has three wheels. Could triceratops mean three? It does. So, triceratops Five. means three horn face because, well, obviously it has three horns, right? Okay. Now, when we look at this thing, what are those horns used for? Battling. Battling? Okay, what are they battling? T-Rex or other triceratops. Oh, excellent. You got both answers that I was looking for, okay? There are lots and lots of triceratops skulls that they find with these big holes, you know, punched through them from other Triceratops horns, okay? So there's evidence that they were fighting, okay? And also to protect themselves from predators like T-Rex. So very, very good. Now the Ceratopsians, those horned dinosaurs, had been around for millions and millions of years. 25 million years before the first Triceratops was around, there was a species in China. Maybe you've seen this one. Can I show you a, a skull from another dinosaur? Yeah, okay. I already know what it is. Gallum. What do you think it is? Something like that. Which Gallum. one? Gallum or something like that. Oh, nope. It's this one. Oh, Protoceratops. I thought That's it was Awesome, about nice. So Protoceratops means first. Now we're talking about T-Rex. Yep. So this thing, was fighting dinosaurs like Velociraptor, okay, in China. This is 75 million years old, okay? Now, Protoceratops was one of the first Ceratopsians because obviously it doesn't really have the big horns, right? But the name means first horn face. And we just start to see that first little bump there. Isn't that cool? Because, you know, she wasn't going after you know, fighting T-Rex-sized dinosaurs. She didn't quite need the big horns yet. But still, Velociraptor was a nasty little dinosaur. If you've seen the Jurassic Park movies, those movies make uh, Velociraptor much, much bigger than they actually were. Uh, I always say Velociraptor was about the size, I saw that, <laughs> about, about the size of a turkey. So it's something that you could eat on Thanksgiving if they were still around, okay? 
Now, Velociraptor was hunting these. Did you have something to say, Hunter? I have a book about Jurassic World, and they said that it is the Velociraptor, but they increased its size. They did. I'm glad they were honest about that. That's, that's very true. They made it huge compared to a real Velociraptor. Like I said, it's about the size of a turkey. But we've got that frill, okay? Now, this frill is not that thick. It's maybe an eighth of an inch thick of bone, okay? And in, in here, in these little spaces, it was probably skin or like cartilage. So if you don't know what cartilage is, feel your ear. It's tougher than skin, but it's not quite bone, right? That's cartilage. Your ears are made of cartilage. Oh, and you're, I saw you were touching your nose there. Yep, there's cartilage in your nose. Put them in the same thing in here, all right? And that's just enough to protect itself from a little turkey-sized dinosaur called Velociraptor, okay? This is great for protecting its neck because the neck is kind of a vulnerable spot, right? Because it can't reach back and get it. So when you've got a nice frill like this, Velociraptor can help you, or it can protect you from Velociraptor. Um, did any of you watch the program that we had last week? Okay, do you remember Sean talked about the Velociraptor and the Protoceratops, right? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Isn't Sean cool? I wish I could grow a beard like him, but I was there. I was just sitting off to the side trying to grow a beard. Did it work? No, no. I'll try later. <laughs> All right. So, let's put, I put that away, okay? So, that was from 75 million years ago, okay? About 9 million years later, it went from little protoceratops slowly growing over the course of 9 million years and changing into newer and newer and newer species, each one getting a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger until we get this thing, Triceratops. It's huge. It could easily defend itself from T-Rex, right? Mm-hmm. Because it has those nasty, nasty horns, right? What else? I the, yeah? I heard that when continental shift was happening, Protoceratops migrated to America. And yep. I guess... And I assume they had to fight Eoraptor and Coelophysis. Oh, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. Now, Protoceratops probably wasn't the one migrating. It was probably other species that came after it, okay? Again, they're a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, but slowly they spread out. And yes, there was a land bridge and the Ceratopsians then came into North America and went boom in terms of size. They're a cool group of animals, okay? One of my favorites, but not nearly as awesome as T-Rex, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got this great big frill. Do you remember how thin the frill was on Protoceratops? Using your fingers, show me. It was about that thin, wasn't it? How thick do you think that frill is? Mm -hmm. About okay. a foot. What's that? About a foot. About a foot? At the base of the skull, it is about a foot, okay? It's really, really thick. But even at the very edge, let's see if I can, there, there not bad, huh? Even at the very edge, it's almost two inches of solid bone. That is to protect itself from T-Rex-sized dinosaurs, okay? A thin little frill wouldn't do much to protect yourself from T-Rex, would it? Mm -mm. Or other Triceratops when they're angry, right? Doing the head-to-head -head thing, okay? So if we look at right where its skull comes into its neck, those bones are built kind of interesting. You can almost see, it looks like... Uh, like a ball going in, like a big ball and socket joint. You see that? You can do that, okay? Because this thing was not a fast animal. It's got short little legs, okay? It was slow. T-Rexes, or T-Rex, was actually a fairly quick animal for its size. Uh, some professors from Wisconsin at a university called uh, UW-La Crosse, yeah, yep, 
they did this awesome study and they found that T-Rex, even though it's huge, was able to turn faster than most other dinosaurs of that same size. And there were some other species that were maybe a little bit longer than T-Rex, but T-Rex was quick because its ancestors were these small little things that darted all over the place, all right? So that neck bone, right where it joins the skull there, okay? This allows the Triceratops to always kind of move its head so that it's trying to keep T-Rex away. All right, now would you like to see some other things? I've been sitting here quite a while talking, haven't I? Okay. I'm gonna move this table over. Come with me, okay? <laughs> All right. We're gonna come down to the middle of our Triceratops. And you can see a whole table full of cool stuff. Are you ready for this, kids? Me too. Let me grab my chair, all right? All right, I'm back. So now you get to see the middle portion of our Triceratops, and it is huge, okay? This thing is about eight or nine feet wide. Now, depending on who you talk to, some people say Triceratops weighs anywhere from four to eight tons. I've even heard some scientists say up to 10 tons. I think that's a little big, but still, four to eight tons is huge. Now we're talking the weight of one or two African elephants. Your average African elephant is only about three to four tons. We know they're huge, right? But still, only three to four tons. I always thought they were bigger, but they're not. You do get some individuals that are gargantuan, <laughs> right? Now this thing, huge. Like I said, it's eight feet tall, okay? Because what we have going on is a predator-prey relationship. Last week, if you watched the Predators and Prey program, we talked about how the predators, the meat eaters, and the prey animals, the plant eaters, were always trying to one-up each other, get a little bit bigger to give them an edge, okay? Same thing was going on with T-Rex and Triceratops. So let's start talking about T-Rex, okay? Here's a small model of a T-Rex skull. Now, out of all of the dinosaurs that are out there, I think we know more about T-Rex than actually, we know more about T-Rex than we know about some animals that are still alive today. Isn't that cool? It's because people are so fascinated with this predator. They want to know more about it. And you know, some little bugs on some strange little island out in the middle of the ocean, people aren't gonna study those that much. Especially when we have, you know, at this point, two or three dozen really nice specimens of T-Rex. And every single one that they dig up, we learn that much more about the animal, okay? Let's talk about the teeth. I've got some really cool things I wanna show you. All right, now, what I have right here are two teeth. We're gonna call this one Exhibit A and this one Exhibit B, okay? So both of these come from very, very large meat-eating dinosaurs. Uh, exhibit A here is a dinosaur called Acrocanthosaurus. It was a Cretaceous era or Cretaceous period dinosaur. Have any of you heard of Acrocanthosaurus? It's not very well known, but still, when they were fully grown, they were almost 40 feet long. So similar length to a T-Rex, okay? So we've got their tooth here. Now this one is actually missing the root. So the root, you know, our teeth are buried up in our jaw, right? Because if we didn't have roots, our teeth would just bloop, fall out, right? And we wouldn't want that to happen. So this thing is missing the root. Let's just put it this way. When it was ready to bite you in half, this is the part you would see, okay? Makes sense, right? Now, exhibit B, this tiny skinny little tooth here, believe it or not, comes from the longest meat-eating dinosaur that ever lived. Do you know what the name of that one is? No, it's from Africa, Egypt, they find them in Morocco. 
Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus. Very good. Yep. So this is a tooth. Yeah. So this is a tooth from a Spinosaurus. And I always get a lot of kids like, wait a minute, that can't be. Because Spinosaurus is huge, right? Well, I agree. Uh-huh. You know, first time I saw this tooth, I thought the exact same thing. But then I started reading about it and I realized, oh, this makes sense why it has such small teeth. So now, today, we know a lot more about Spinosaurus than, say, 20 years ago. And today we realized that Spinosaurus was actually this kind of skinny crocodile-shaped dinosaur that lived in rivers and lakes primarily, okay? It was not going after elephant-sized triceratops dinosaurs, okay? This was going after fish. Most of its diet was fish. So when you have these skinny little sharp teeth like this, those are great for grabbing onto big slippery fish in the water. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. So let's look at these. Let's compare them to a T-Rex tooth. Are you okay if we do that? So am I, okay? Here is one tooth from a T-Rex named Stan. <laughs> I saw your eyes, that is awesome. This is a single tooth, okay? Now, remember we talked about you know, size of bananas? This is actually bigger than uh, most bananas. From this end to this end is 12 inches long. It's at one foot, okay? Now, can you see this line right there? That was the end of the root. So all of this right here was buried deep into the skull to help hold that tooth in place because when it was ready to bite you, this is the part that you would see. Now, these teeth are so cool. Now, I wouldn't uh, back in the day before that fun virus came, kidding, it's not fun. Um, back in the day before uh, the virus came, when we were visiting schools and libraries all over the state of Wisconsin, we got a lot of questions from kids saying, hey, Dino Dave, if a T-Rex and a Spinosaurus got in a fight, who would win? Because most kids think, oh, Spinosaurus is the biggest. Mm, if we were to compare these teeth, what do you think? Hmm. Yeah, Triceratops, right? Or, not Triceratops, T-Rex. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I just did that <gasps> to my favorite dinosaur, okay? So when we look at the skull, there is no other dinosaur skull that is built quite like this. It is thick. The muscle that was built around this skull was massive, okay? T-Rex had the strongest bite of any animal that ever walked on land. I'm gonna say that one more time close to my microphone. T-Rex has the strongest bite of any animal that ever walked on land. Much, much stronger than your little brother's bite, Hunter. <laughs> has he ever bit you on accident or on purpose? No. Go ahead and bite Hunter. I'm joking, don't do that, don't do that. All right. <laughs> Mom, the guy told him to bite me. All right, all right. So when we look at this skull, here's some really cool things. A T-Rex's sense of smell is amazing. From here to here, if this were a real full-size T-Rex skull, that distance would be about three feet. We're talking like, far apart, okay? The longer your nasal passages, the more time you, you can uh, take to uh, take in all those scents and smells. And they realized that, so a T-Rex's brain is kind of shaped like this. Well, kind of a similar size to this tooth, okay? But this much of T-Rex's brain was devoted to the sense of smell. They said a T-Rex's sense of smell was so good that they could smell something dead, like a dead Triceratops from 10 miles away. Think of someone you know or a town that's 10 miles away. You can ask the grown-ups around you at some point if you want to, okay? A T-Rex could smell something from that far away. 
Isn't that cool? Okay. Another neat thing. Now, all of the predatory dinosaurs, the meat-eating dinosaurs, they had eyes on the side of their head, okay? Which allowed them to look out this way, okay? Which makes it very hard to see in like three dimension, all right? T-Rex's eyes, so these are the eye sockets, okay? Right here, that's the nostril. That's just uh, an opening, we call that a fenestra. Can you, all you kids say fenestra or fenestre? Fenestra? Nice, good. A fenestra is basically a hole. We call windows fenestra as well because it's a hole in a building, okay? The more you know, right? So that's a fenestra. And this is the eye socket in this third hole, okay? A T-Rex's eyes were looking straight forward. Can you think of any other animals that have eyes facing right in the front of their face? Hmm. Any? Any? Me? What about you? Do you have eyes facing forward? We all do, okay? So yeah. humans have eyes facing forward. What about your, you know, any of you have a dog or a cat? Dogs and cats do yeah, too. They, every animal that every animal that eat meat eat has eye going forward, and every animal that eat draft has eye. Yep. So generally speaking, what you just said was so mammals specifically. Mammals typically the predators have eyes facing forward. And the plant eaters have eyes facing on the side. If you ever seen a goat, when you really look at a goat, their eyes are kind of goofy looking because they do stick straight out. This allows them to see predators coming from all the way around. Now, hunters, we want our eyes facing forward because it allows us to gauge how far away something is. So when I do this to you, you know to go, whoa, okay? Having eyes facing forward allows you and me to play catch with a ball. Because if you had eyes on the side of your head, that would be like trying to play catch with one eye closed, which believe me is really hard. I wouldn't want to try and catch a ball that you threw at me. And I don't think I could see I missed. Okay. Lose your depth perception. Depth. depth perception. Excellent. 3D vision, binocular vision. They all mean the same thing. Basically, you can tell how far away something is. And T-Rex's eyeballs were huge. These softballs are the approximate size of a T-Rex's eyes, okay? Except I can't see you right now, all right? Now, T-Rex's eyeballs were facing forward. Oh, that is so weird. <laughs> That is fun. All right. So a T-Rex's eyes are facing forward. And they say because its eyes were so big and because they had binocular vision, they could see a triceratops moving along on a hill really far away, about two or three miles away. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I don't think human vision is that good. All right. Especially to know, oh, hey, that's a triceratops on that hill over there. Time for lunch. And the cool thing is T-Rex, they breathed, had the similar muscle, muscle structure as modern birds do, okay? And birds, their lungs, let me put it this way. Mammal lungs, you and me, basically like two balloons in our chest, okay? They go, <sighs> right? They expand, contract, expand, contract. Bird lungs and dinosaur lungs, were incredible. It wasn't just two bags on their chest, okay? They, their lungs actually went up into their head and through their bones and down their tails and into their legs and arms, okay? This allowed for this really cool circular breathing system. So T-Rex was like the ultimate long distance speed walker, okay? It couldn't run because it was so big and heavy, but it could walk at speeds because its legs are so long anywhere from 10 to 25 miles per hour, depending on who you talk to. Now, 10 miles an hour is fast. I can run 10 miles an hour on our treadmill at home, but I can't do it for very long, okay? T-Rex could do it for miles and miles 
and miles. And if T-Rex is faster than this big thing behind me, it's going to catch up to its lunch very soon, okay? Very quickly. All right, now, uh, more proof that T-Rex is related to birds is this bone right here. I have a lot of kids who say, hey, Dino Dave, is this a boomerang? Because I could throw it. And uh, in about two minutes, it's gonna come back. Just kidding, I didn't throw it. This is called a furcula. Only birds and the two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs have a furcula, okay? Now, what a fur what is what's a furcula, Dino Dave? A we have collarbones. Bone. What's that? A wishbone. You, how did you know that? Eh. Yeah, you just knew. That is so cool. <laughs> you, you are a first. I've never had someone tell me that before. But you're absolutely right. The furcula, its common name today is the wishbone. This is the bone that you would crack, you know, on Thanksgiving with the turkey, okay? But don't crack my Tyrannosaurus Rex wishbone, no. I think someone actually did try it. I think this one's glued together in a couple spots, right? But a furcula or wishbone are actually the collarbones that are fused together. Now, you and I, because we're mammals, you can feel right here, you have your collarbone, and you can feel your other one here. Now, if I raise this shoulder, I can feel that collarbone moving, but the other one is not moving. Or I could switch it up and do the same thing. This one's not moving. Well, this one is. That was impossible for a T-Rex or a bird because the two collarbones fuse together right at the center into one solid bone, the furcula or wishbone, right? Now we know of lots and lots of really famous T-Rexes today, okay? Um, the one that I showed you, his name is Stan. Stan was found by a company out in South Dakota called the Black Hills Institute back in 1992, I believe, when you were all born, right? No, <laughs> not even close, right? That ages me, all right? Stan has one of the most complete skulls of any T-Rex that ever lived, okay? It's a beautiful specimen. Um, in fact, the Black Hills Institute just announced that they're trying to sell their original Stan the T-Rex for only six or eight million dollars. I, I can't afford that, okay? Now, another really well-known one, perhaps the most famous T-Rex that ever lived, is Sue. Now, Sue the T-Rex is huge. She was found by the same company, the Black Hills Institute, in 1991, the year before Stan was discovered. Now, the neat thing about Sue, though, she's the most complete T-Rex ever discovered. They found 90% of her skeleton, okay? So only a small fraction of her bones were missing, okay? And she was massive, okay? She was 42 feet long, and they think she was nine tons. That's the same as two elephants. Actually, more than two elephants, okay? Um, she was big. But just about a year or two ago, some paleontologists from Canada said, oh, nope, we now have the largest T-Rex ever. His name is Scotty. Scotty was not nearly as complete as Sue's skeleton, but with the bones that they did have, they compared them and measured them, and they realized that every single one of Scotty's bones were just slightly larger than Sue's bones. So they think Scotty was nine and a half tons. That's 19,000 pounds. Do you know how many like chocolate bars that is? Or carrots, right? Because we're all eating our vegetables this summer, right? Mm-hmm. Now we're going to have a word after this program. I'm kidding. All right. Another cool thing about T-Rex and that bird connection. You ready? Look at this. This is kind of like your modern day model. Now, when I was a kid, all of my dinosaur books showed T-Rex as being scaly and its tail was kind of dragging on the ground and it walked around like this and probably made it sound like, right? Today, 
in large part thanks to the hard work from many, many paleontologists, we know that T. rex was walking like this. Its body was straight. It was kind of like a big teeter-totter, okay? Its tail matched this end, okay? So it was perfectly balanced. Again, teeter-totter, seesaw, okay? Except for that Y. rex that we were talking about earlier where two-thirds of its tail was bitten off. That one probably <laughs> was walking around like this, okay? But what do you notice about this toy? That feathers. 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 No. I'll eat pizza. Did you find that kind of weird or like, oh yeah, T-Rex had feathers? By the way, oh, what's yeah, that giant too. bone over there behind you? What giant bone? Over there. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, okay? I promise. All right? Okay. So, T-Rex, we don't have really any evidence, fossil evidence, that T-Rex was covered in feathers. But T-Rex, we know of about two dozen species in the Tyrannosaur family. So they were like cousins to T-Rex, and some of them were so well-preserved, their fossils, that we realized that their bodies were covered in feathers. One is called U Tyrannus from China, maybe found 10 years ago. Its whole body was covered in feathers. And it was so closely related to T Rex that many paleontologists say, yeah, T Rex probably had some feathers. Now, we don't know where or how many, but I think the possibility that T Rex was feathered is fairly high, despite what your grown ups and maybe grandparents would say because their dinosaur books never showed anything like that, okay? So how are we doing on time? We've got about 15 minutes left. First of all, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Can we look at that fossil now? <laughs> that is a very good question. Does everyone else agree with with him and yeah, we should look at the fossil. Okay. How about this one? <laughs> we'll work our way up, okay? This is the upper jaw from a very close relative of T-Rex called Albertosaurus, okay? Now, it's not quite as old as a T-Rex, or excuse me, it's not quite as large as a T-Rex because, you know, if we were to compare Acrocanthosaurus, we would say, oh yeah, Acrocanthosaurus was larger than Albertosaurus. But we're starting to get those really cool Tyrannosaur-like features, which includes those funny little Tyrannosaur arms. Now, this is an arm from Albertosaurus and a T-Rex's arm was not much bigger. These are all the hand bones and we have the claws. Okay, this is called a manus claw, okay? And the hand bones. What do you notice about the hand? Do you see how many fingers there are? Three. Three. And I what? see a tiny thumb over there. Uh-huh. Most T-Rex toys just show two fingers, don't they? So when they discovered Sue the T-Rex, remember? Most complete T-Rex known they realized that T-Rex actually had a third finger. It had never been found before because look at it, this is a small bone. It's smaller than my finger, you know, to the second knuckle, all right? But the thing is, it was so small that the skin probably went right over it and you may have seen a little bump on the side of the hand, but that's it, okay? Now, another cool thing about these, Obviously, T-Rex arms are ridiculously short. Am I right? Yes. Now, if we were just to look at the hand bones, pretend it didn't have claws for a second. If I line my hand up, do you see that my hand, this tiny little human who only weighs, you know, 180 pounds, my hand is bigger than a T-Rex's hand? By maybe half an inch, okay? Now, these two bones here, the radius and ulna from its forearm. Your forearm, show me your forearm right here, okay? 
you have your radius, which is attached to your thumb, and your ulna that goes down the middle there, okay? What do you notice? You see how ridiculously short a T-Rex's arm is compared to mine? So my forearm is about twice the length of a T-Rex's. I can thank some ape ancestors for that. Did you have a question, Hunter? Oh wait, Hunter's brother has a question. Yeah or no? Or are you just, okay. All right, now, just because they were short doesn't mean they were weak. They say each arm, and you kids probably know this too, each arm could lift about 400 pounds. That's a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Let's talk a little bit more about T-Rex's prey. That thing there, okay? This little thing is the horn from a baby Triceratops, okay? It's almost adorable, isn't it? Would you agree with me, okay? So this is the horn from a baby Triceratops. Yeah, just tiny little thing. But we know they got huge, okay? Hmm. We've seen a Triceratops horn, haven't we? I'm glad that was just a toy. Are you glad that was just a toy? Me too, okay? Well, thing a Dino Dave is a klutz. <laughs> He's a little uncoordinated, right? Now, here's the really cool thing about Triceratops, though, okay? We have evidence that T. rex ate Triceratops. And it starts with this bone right here. I actually have to back up a little bit, don't I? Let's see what else I can run into. This is a leg bone from a Triceratops. It's the femur. Now, have you ever heard of a femur before? Do you know which leg bone that is? No? So... If we were to stand up, it's this leg bone right there, okay? Hello. So it's your upper leg. Everyone say hello to your femur, okay? Hello. Most people I know have two. <laughs> so this is the femur from a Triceratops. And this leg bone in particular is very, very famous. You'll find copies of this in museums all over the world. And it has a really cool nickname. It's called the T-Rex Biscuit. Can you see why they call it the T-Rex biscuit? What evidence do we have? Anyone? Keyhole. Free keyhole. Yep. We have bite marks on this femur. Right here, right here, here, and... You see my fingers sticking all the way through the bone? That's a bite mark from a T-Rex. Remember when I said that T-Rex has the strongest bite of any animal that ever walked on land, right? Here's kind of how hard a T-Rex's bite is. For example, you and I, so we measure bite, how hard you can bite. Uh, we use a term called the bite force. Now you and I have a maximum bite force of about 175 pounds per square inch. Right, who's thinking, Dino Dave, what on earth does that mean? You can raise your hand, yeah, okay. So 175 pounds per square inch. Now a square inch is about this big. Now pretend that the weight of my entire body was balanced on that little spot, which was on your hand. Do you think that would hurt if I was standing tippy toe on your hand, okay? That would feel approximately the same as Hunter's brother biting his finger. Go ahead. No? <laughs> okay, just joking. Okay, so that's 175 pounds per square inch. Now, Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, they have a bite force anywhere from like four to 800 pounds per square inch, okay? Now we're talking almost half a ton of weight oh, resting on that. That would hurt if that was resting on your hand, wouldn't it? Yes. The big heavy hitters today for land animals are Nile and saltwater crocodiles. They have, remember our crocodile skull that we looked at earlier? They have a maximum bite force that's anywhere from like two to three 
thousand pounds per square inch. Now we're talking like a ton and a half of weight resting on one square inch. Now we're cracking through bone, aren't we, right? You're not gonna have much of a hand left, neither would I in that situation. So two to 3,000 pounds per square inch. What about a T-Rex? T-Rex has a bite force that is almost 13,000 pounds per square inch. That's like the weight of an elephant resting on a little spot like that. An elephant tippy-toeing on your hand. Ouch! Ouch! That is an excellent response. Thank you. Okay? That sums it up quite nicely. And that is the reason why you have such deep bite marks, especially here, in the leg bone of this massive, massive animal. No other dinosaur was capable of inflicting that kind of damage, okay? And if we actually take our stand tooth here, it, Matt, it fits perfectly, okay? Now there are two really cool theories with the T-Rex biscuit. I'm gonna share both of them with you and you're gonna tell me which one you think is accurate. And here's the thing, there's no right answer and there's no wrong answer. So it really doesn't matter what you say, okay? Cause there isn't any evidence going either way. Theory number one, are you ready? Theory number one, playing my guitar, is that T-Rex eats this Triceratops here, fills its belly full of delicious Triceratops meat and walks off. At which point, a whole bunch of tiny, tiny little predators, kind of the size of a velociraptor, were waiting in the bushes and they're like, oh, T-Rex is gone. Let's finish what's left. Kind of like vultures, you know, they circle around up in the sky and wait for the lions and hyenas to finish eating the zebra. Once the lions and hyenas are gone, the vultures come down and eat whatever's left, right? Let's look really closely at this bone. Are you ready? Can you see a whole bunch of little holes here, like right there? If I were to count all of the tiny little holes in this bone, okay, a whole bunch there, there are more than 200 bite marks on this femur. So that's theory number one, is that little scavengers, little tiny velociraptor-sized dinosaurs came in after T-Rex finished eating, okay? Theory number two is that, are you ready for this one? Mama T-Rex chomps down on this leg, okay? And carries the leg back to her nest and flops it down on the ground. And all those little tiny bite marks could be from baby T-Rexes. What do you think? Could it be the scavengers or the baby T-Rexes? Again, there's no wrong answer. Both. Both? I think you're the first one who's ever said both. I like that. All right. But that's pretty cool, isn't that? That's behavioral science because we know what a T-Rex was doing one day. It was eating a triceratops. Oh, well. These ones, right? Okay. I now we've got five minutes left. I still have to show you some cool things, don't I? I do. All right. Now, let me find out where they are. Just kidding. Okay. I've got two more items that I want to show you before we finish up here. Okay. So T-Rex was first discovered back in the early 1900s by a guy named Barnum Brown. He was an interesting chap. He really thought he was the best person in the world who ever lived, okay? We don't like those kinds of personalities, okay? But he did make some really cool contributions to science, including the discovery of a T-Rex, okay? I saw that, all right? The last two items that I wanna show you are pretty big, okay? Are you ready? Do we have time? I'm kidding. Let's show you the last two items, okay? Here's the first one. Okay, here, ready? What do you think this is? This is a copy of a footprint from a T-Rex. 
This was discovered a few years ago in the state of New Mexico. Okay, so now because of this, we realize that T. rex lived as far south that we know of as New Mexico, okay? And probably went down into Mexico too, okay? If I were to measure this from the bottom to the way top, it's about three feet long, okay? And I'll tell you right now, Sue's, Sue the T-Rex, her footprint was probably even bigger. But this thing squished down into the mud about eight inches deep one day, okay? Because that's how heavy they are. All that weight resting on these two giant feet, okay? So when it steps in the mud, it's gonna go squish, okay? Fortunately, soon after that T-Rex walked off, the mud dried, okay? Got hard, and then was covered up again with more mud and layers and layers and layers and layers. In over 65 million years, those layers of mud started to turn into solid rock. And then someone discovered this footprint and made a copy and we bought it, okay? So this is a massive foot, right? How many of your shoes do you think would fit inside this thing, okay? Use my hand as a reference. Yeah? 75. How do you find a footprint if it's been buried? Because well, you just blend right in. Yeah, well slowly over time, you know, so it's buried, but then over time, those top layers start to wash away. They start to erode. That's the word that we like to use. But they wash away and slowly grind away until we get back down to this bottom layer again. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Basically, the ground above it slowly started to wash away. So, all right. Now, are you ready to see our very last item? This thing is so cool. We talked a lot about Stan the T-Rex, right? I've got one more item from Stan that I'd love to show you. And that's over here. So I'm gonna, I know you can hear me, but I'm gonna set down the footprint and try not to fall over. And here we go. Okay, are you ready? This is so cool. This is Stan's lower jaw, okay? We call this a dentary, and oh my goodness, you'd have a bad day if you were actually, this was a real T-Rex, okay? And my mouth was in its head. There's actually another bone that comes back here, which would make the full jaw even longer, okay? About four feet long. But this dentary right here teaches us a lot about T-Rex. One is that T-Rex never had to brush its teeth. And it's not because its arms were too short, right? And it's not because they didn't make toothbrushes back then either, okay? If I were to flip this around, and now you're looking at the inside, so ah, back there, okay? The inside of Stan's jaw. Do you see right there? And right there? What are those? Teeth. They're teeth, yes. They're all new teeth. A T-Rex was losing one tooth about every couple weeks. So maybe lost, you know, one or two teeth a month throughout its entire life. How many teeth do humans have? Or how many sets of teeth do we get? Two. Two, very good. We have our baby teeth and our adult teeth, right? How many of you have lost a tooth? Maybe get to three sets of teeth if we get old enough. My mom told me that. Really? I did not know that. That's uh, something I'm going to have to verify with uh, an encyclopedia. Do you kids know what encyclopedias are? Never mind. Anyways, T-Rex was always growing new teeth throughout its entire life. Because it has like 60 teeth in its mouth, they've got to stay sharp because this is something that was chomping through bone, right? We saw the Triceratops leg earlier. Eventually, a tooth was going to break, okay? So that's why every few months, a new tooth would come in and push the old one out. You can see that this one was eventually going to fall out because this tooth down here was going to push it out, right? All right, second thing about this jaw, which I think is even cooler, 
Can you all see this hole right here? Can you all see that? It looks like kind of a rip, doesn't it? It's not supposed to be there. Neither is this hole. What do you think those are? Put on your scientist thinking hats. What's your Bite best? marks. What's that? Bite marks. Did you and have a guess? Claw too? marks. Claw marks, bite marks. Yeah. All right. These are indeed bite marks from the Triceratops horn. Oh, a Triceratops horn. That's a good one, too. So when scientists study this thing, they think they are 99% sure that these are bite marks from another T-Rex, meaning Stan had a really bad day about 66 million years ago, okay? So what we think happened, another T-Rex got in a fight with Stan one day, and that thing came up underneath Stan's mouth and clamped down on his jaw, and its teeth popped all the way through the bone, okay? Again, this is close to an inch thick of solid bone, okay? It was not easy being a T-Rex, okay? Because it was dealing with other T-Rexes. It was dealing with that, which did not want to get eaten, right? They're just an awesome, awesome animal. So I am so excited that I got to share all of these things with you, even though it was through a computer, but still pretty awesome, all right? Do you have any questions for me before we sign off? I have another theory about the the um thigh. Yeah. Um, I don't think it would give away its food just because it would go through a life or death battle to eat. I don't think it would just forget its food for smaller animals. That's interesting. So, do you think what do you think those little bite marks could have been from? Gnawing on the bone after eating. All right. Kind of small teeth marks though. Not nearly as big as that. I like where your brain is going though, okay? I like that you're thinking. All right, any other questions about anything that we discussed today? No? All right, did you enjoy this program? Thumbs yeah. up? Yep. Yeah. What, what, what about the food underneath the tea? Thank you. Oh, thank you. What, what was that one question? I didn't quite hear it. Why the food underneath the cheek? Oh, the hole underneath the cheek? The. Who the running? One, the eye, the blue one, blue dent mark kind of thing. Oh, so your audio is kind of on the area. Out. I could only hear about half of what you say, and I apologize. The holes on the other side of the jaw, I think, is. What he's asking. Oh, 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 I know what you're talking about. Are you talking about these? Yeah, yeah. Excellent mm -hmm. question. Thank you very much. All right. There are a few different theories with these holes here, okay? One is that these were possibly, so first of all, not bite marks, okay? These are just way too perfectly lined up. Theory number one is that maybe blood vessels were coming in and out here, okay, along the jawline. Another theory is that maybe they were uh, nerves coming in and out. Gave it a very sensitive face, okay? So it could maybe feel its way around. You know, like dogs have whiskers? Oh, maybe T-Rex had whiskers. I don't know, okay? Another theory though, so we're on to three theories with, with these holes, okay? None of them have been quite proven yet. One is that these are possibly salivatory glands, meaning spit, saliva, possibly had a mouthful of nasty, juicy spit, okay? Um, T-Rex possibly 
these are what some theories are saying, is that you know this thing was eating meat and didn't brush its teeth, right? Its spit could have been loaded with bacteria. So even if a T-Rex was not successful with a hunt, if it could still bite an animal, and <clears throat> its feeding and hunting style is what we call a puncture pull technique. This thing was capable of ripping off about four to 500 pounds in a single bite. So if it could get close enough to an animal, it would go clamp down and rip out, okay? With that mouth full of just, you know, the spit with all the germs, bacteria, nasty stuff in there, that animal that got bit, if you've ever seen the documentaries of like Komodo dragons um, going after these uh, wild buffalo, could have been a very similar thing. <clears throat> Komodo dragon bites the buffalo and it takes a few days, but the buffalo eventually gets an infection and dies. It's possible that same thing was going on with things like Triceratops and the big duckbill dinosaurs. T-Rex would come bite it, give it a more or less poisonous bite from all the germs, and then the thing would die a few days later. So it didn't matter if T-Rex was successful in its hunt or not. Either way, it was going to get a meal. Excellent question. I watched the show. I watched the show where they were where Kamala Drayden bit a buffalo. I think you and I have seen the same documentary. That one's kind of hard to watch, but it's fascinating, isn't it? And that's the neat thing about animal documentaries wow, because track. we can learn a lot about dinosaurs that are extinct by watching animals today. Again, because they had very similar behaviors. Maybe the feathers were for, for hiding in the tree. Camouflage. Camouflage. And Excellent. You blend in and then in spray and drinking, run out, drag. Yeah. So maybe instead of this fancy teal and the big red head, maybe they're more camouflage stripes or spots like predators today. You don't typically see predators with big, bright, beautiful colors, right? They tend to blend in very, very well with their surroundings. So awesome observations. All right, so with that, I've got to sign off, but I'm so glad that you were all able to join us. Thank you so much for hanging out with us next week. Same time, Friday at one o'clock PM, we're going to be talking about Ice Age Giants, which is one of my favorite programs. Yeah, because, I, so dinosaurs are awesome. I, don't you. get me wrong. Thank yeah, thank you. But the Ice Age mammals, a lot of them lived right here in Wisconsin. We're gonna learn all about them next week. So again, Friday, one o'clock PM, Ice Age Giants. And until then, have a wonderful week. Yeah, Adios. You person next week? Thank, Thank you. you.